and who is going to talk about the functional anatomy of the brain revisited towards connectomics and neuroplasticity. Um, Professor Dobo, please. Thank you so much for your kind invitation to share my experience regarding your plasticity in uh, a patient uh, with a brain tumor and knowing that I did surgery in this uh, very specific field for approximately 20 years. Indeed, uh, I have learned that the brain was uh, fixed when I was younger and for many decades uh, we thought that uh, there was a uh, very little potential of neuroplasticity, especially in adults. In fact, especially thanks to uh, functional imaging, we have learned uh, that uh, there was a more complex uh, networking organization of the brain. And uh, my goal today is to try to use uh, this uh, better understanding of a connectomal account uh, of brain processing in order to explain how it's possible to use it in uh, uh, um, clinical practice, and especially in uh, brain tumor, because you can see that uh, sometimes uh, uh, you can meet patients with a very impressive brain tumor located in so-called eloquent areas according to a localizationist view, in this case, the left frontal loop, and in fact, that they enjoy perfect normal life and the neuropsychological scores are normal. I will not speak about uh, brain surgery per se today, but uh, you have to understand that the goal is to remove not the tumor, but a part of the brain invaded by chronic disease and to preserve the quality of life. So we need uh, mm, to use this potential of brain plasticity. And then more than 10 years ago, we decided to do functional imaging before and after surgery. And uh, um, especially to apply the concept, uh, the theory of graph, in order to understand that, that uh, there was modification of the connectivity when we met a patient for the first time. Most of the time, they enjoy normal life, as I said. They had seizures, and in fact, how the brain was able to reorganize thanks to a modification of the functional connectivity. However, we have to understand also that functional imaging is not reliable, especially at the individual level. Indeed, we demonstrated that the reliability was around approximately 80%, and this is true, especially for DTI, you know, probably the uh, new uh, paper in Nature Communication telling, in fact, tractography is not reliable. And I know that, of course, because I have the um, uh, experience to do wake mapping in this patient and to check exactly what happened during surgery and to correlate with functional imaging recently with the resting state, I can tell you that the reliability is around also 80 to 85 percent, but not 99 percent. So I have the truth in front of me by asking to the patient to do neuropsychological examination during surgery and by applying intraoperative electrical mapping both at the level of the cortex and the white matter tract. And then once again, we are removing a part of the brain invaded by chronic disease uh, according to the functional boundaries at the individual level regarding both the cortex, the projection fibers, the association fibers. And then what we have learned is, first of all, that uh, there is a networking brain. You know that, okay? But first of all, the Broca's area does not exist. I mean, I stimulated this area, even if not invaded by the tumor, in hundreds of patients, and we induced speech arrest in 5% of cases. That means that this area is involved, in fact, in a networking brain in more complex function like semantic processing. You can tell me, in fact, during surgery, you have just to ask the patient to move and to speak, but in fact, no, we can adapt according to the quality of life of the patient. I mean, if you are a lawyer, we can ask them to do judgment tasks. If you are a mathematician, to map mathematics, so calculation. If you are a dancer, to map in the so-called right non-dominant hemisphere, the spatial cognition. If you are a writer, semantic, not only semantic, but syntactic processing. But in all cases, what we do now is to map behavior, networks involved in theory of mind. And we'll speak about that a little bit later. It's true for the cortex, but it's true also for the Y matter tract. And in fact, today, Strange, but in the field of brain mapping meeting, the sole methodology allowing you to have an insight regarding the real function of the Y matter tract is the direct stimulation. DTI 
does not give you any functional information. You would like to believe on that, but this is not the truth. While the patient is awake, when you stimulate, you will induce transitorily a deficit corresponding to the subfunction of the subnetwork at that time. And of course, it's true for movement, it's true for somatosensory pathway, it's true for visual pathway. I mean, transitorily, you will induce deficit, and then you can remove the part of the brain thanks to reorganization, your plasticity mechanisms according to the functional boundaries. And all these patients you can see enjoy a normal life with no more neuropsychological scores. And this is the reason why we discovered also that there was a network involved in the control of movement. I mean, you can accelerate, you can inhibit the movement. And we started to understand that it was related uh, to the subnetwork involving in, in the um, frontal striatal tract and the fat too regarding speech initiation. So if you stimulate, the, the, the patient will have speech disaster. In the right down dominant hemisphere, we published uh, uh, many years ago with uh, uh, Michel Thibault de Chotin in science uh, the fact that uh, you can induce a transitory immunoglect by stimulating the lateral part, part two of the superior longitudinal fascicle. And it's not our imagination. This is the absolute truth online. Recently, we described in the oculomotor pathway, so we can induce saccades, ocular saccades, and of course, modification in attentional processing. Regarding language, of course, you know that there is a lateral part of the superior fascicle, but I can tell you that in the real truth, when you stimulate, then the patient will have articulatory disorders related to modification of the auditory articulatory loop, and Broca's area is not involved in this loop, but the ventral premolar cortex. But if you stimulate the arcuate fascicle, you will induce a transitory disconnectionism syndrome with, of course, phonological di disorders and repetition disorders, I mean a condition of aphasia. But when you stimulate the ventral somatic pathway, it's not our imagination. You will induce at the level of the lateral part of the inferior frontal occipital fascicle semantic disorders, verbal semantic disorders. But look at the cortical termination. The deep layer is not connecting exactly the same part of the brain. Why? We are speaking about the ventral semantic pathway. And according to DTI, this is the same fibers. In fact, they are not. Because when you stimulate this deep layer, you will induce semantic disorders regarding nonverbal processing. I mean, we start to have an insight into what we call the autonoity consciousness, metacognition, knowing of knowing. And we can disrupt that into the operating theater. And recently, we published paper demonstrating that uh, it was a, a bilateral network, I mean, not just in the left hemisphere, but when you stimulate the right ventral semantic path pathway, you will induce some disorders also regarding specifically this function. It's true for the incinate fascicle, it's true for the inferior longitudinal fascicle. I cannot describe everything today because I have no time, of course, but the goal is to tell you that uh, we can specifically check the function of one subpathway. And it's so exciting because, in fact, we started to understand why it's possible for one subpathway, the inferior frontal occipital fascicle, to compensate another subpathway, for instance, the anterior part of the ILF and the incinate. Explaining one, you can do a very extensive temporal lobectomy in the so called left dominant hemisphere for brain tumor or in epilepsy, and the patient will be perfect for lying surgery because, in fact, we preserve the connectivity and uh, we had bypass explaining how neuroplasticity can help us in order to treat patients with brain damages. And probably also it could be interesting in learning. Why this diagram is interesting is because it's constrained by the real anatomy, the structure, dissection fibers to, in addition to DTI and intraoperative mapping. And the last point is uh, that uh, we started uh, to understand the relationships between cognition, movement, uh, executive function, language, uh, we spoke about that, of course, and uh, emotion. And we can administrate into the operating theater some tasks like uh, the uh, read the mind uh, uh, in IOS in order to disrupt 
the possibility for the patient to be able to recognize emotion in front of you, mentalizing low level theory of mind. And it's underlined especially by the superior longitudinal fascicle, bilaterally speaking. But you have a higher level of uh, um, mentalizing, which is in fact the possibility to infer, extrapolate the intention of others. And it's underlined by bilaterally speaking, the singulate. And it's very important because if you start to imagine this connection between both, you can create artificially what we call autism. But it's not enough because recently we published another paper by telling that there was a third level involved in uh, semantics of emotion. And of course, we have to start to understand the interactions between all subnetworks because the brain now is very plastic if you preserve this connectivity. First of all, when you do the mapping at the cortical level and you redo the mapping following the uh, resection of this part invaded by a tumor, you can see reorganization more or less online. But now, functional imaging is very interesting because you can do longitudinal fMRI before and after surgery, for instance. Following a supplementary molar area syndrome, the patient is transitorily with mutism because we cut or not the fat, we spoke about that, with a deficit of uh, uh, MA body. In fact, the patient will recover thanks, as you can see, to recruitment of the contralateral hemisphere, homologous area. But we can use this potential in order in the same patient to do following first surgery, postoperative rehabilitation to push the uh, uh, plasticity to benefit from fMRI to see that in the same patient over time you have a modification of the map to go back to the OR many years later and to remove more brain invaded by the tumor while preserving the quality of life. In this case, for instance, by removing the knob of the hand and this patient is a guitarist. So this is the level of recovery. Or to remove definitely this so-called Bruckers area, I told you, even when not invaded by the tumor, I insist about that, you induce speech arrest in 5% of cases. That's it at the level of BA44, parsopercularis, you can call as you want. It's not involved in speech. We can do exactly the same thing at the level of the so-called Wernicke's area, the patient is perfect. Why? Because you did not cut the connectivity in the DAP. The limitation of your plasticity are the pathways. If you start to cut the ILF and the arcuate, of course, the patient will have a permanent deficit. And we were very aggressive, I know, by doing sometimes this very extensive resection, but we published paper recently about the fact that this patient had no cognitive disorders, but no deficit of metacognition or behavioral uh, uh, um, scores, uh, um, including using five hours of uh, 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 your psychological assessment. You can remove the so-called Rolandic system, the parietal lobe, all these patients enjoy a perfect normal life. I mean driving, uh, working, uh, no epilepsy, and corpus callosum, for instance, able to play piano while you disconnected a part of the brain. So the results, because today the goal was to use this plasticity for clinical practice, more than 99% of recovery and 30% of improvement, improvement if you start to do cognitive assessment before and after surgery and of course related to the modification of this map. I will not insist about the fact that these patients are living almost now 20 years. So we changed radically the natural history of the disease because we understood that it was a networking brain and it's very important, not only for your surgery, but also epilepsy, neurorehabilitation, neurology, psychiatry, as I said, if you start to incorporate in your cognitive model or in the functional imagine the structure, which is absolutely crucial. And indeed, now we started to do this, uh, to apply this concept before and after surgery, and you can see modification of the connectivity explaining why you can have a recruitment of the contralateral hemisphere allowing you to recover, to totally recover. And recently we published a paper with resting state functional imaging before and after surgery and before and after resection of the supplementary molar area, for instance, 
And we have seen that it was correlated to a decrease of the connectivity between both homologous area. And then when the patient recovered, you had an increase of this inter-hemispheric connectivity. But it's not enough because we can see also that we changed the connectivity at the level of the cortex plus the deep gray nuclei, plus the cerebellum. And it's true for movement, for language, it's true for attention. Once again, I have no time uh, to go beyond. It's true for very integrated uh, uh, function like metacognition. And just to conclude that now the goal is to understand the interactions between these different subnetworks because more or less we have understood the keyboard and the goal is now to play the symphony, the concerto. And the minimal common brain means that if you have a lesion within this connectivity, the patient will not completely recover. And we know that because we published the sole atlas of the function of the y matter tract in the MNI template. It was published in Human Brain Mapping. And it's not our imagination, but just what we have collected in uh, patients. And we were able to propose new model of cognition with interactions between the, the different subfunctions, cognition, cognition, executive function, of course, language, but also emotional process. And finally, we published this paper also regarding an atlas of neuroplasticity, each voxel, you have a probability to recover or not according to the fact that you had a brain damage, stroke, brain tumor surgery. And then you know if the patient will recover or not. We have more than 90% of reliability now in predictive value. So my conclusion in that, functional imaging is crucial, especially because you can repeat it before and after each lesion we are doing. We know when we will go to the OR. It's not like a stroke, but it's not enough because we need to incorporate the structure, the function at the level of the cortex and the Y matter tract. And then we start to know really if a patient is able to recover according to these mechanisms of neuroplasticity. I mean, the connectivity is the limitation of reorganization. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Topol.